coming up next on Passion Struck. One of the things I usually tell people is that it's really a mindset. Thing. For a lot of people, like in their head, it's like, oh, I can't do this. I see how far you, I don't know if I can get there, right? And one of the things I try to tell people is that, like, don't fall into this comparison trap. Like, your day zero will look different from my day zero. And that's okay. Your day 100 will look different from my day 100. And that's okay. Because it's not where you started. It's where you're going. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. I am so honored today to have Martinez Evans on passion struck. Welcome Martinez. Thank you for having me. So as I was doing my research, getting ready for this, it turns out, I think you and my father grew up pretty close to each other. My dad grew up in East Detroit and lived off of seven mile over by Kelly road. And I remember growing up as a kid, Denby High School, if you know where that is, was pretty close to his house. I and mean, we used to play around those neighborhoods as I was growing up as a kid myself. John, that's a full circle moment because you probably don't know that, but I went to Denby High School. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was literally maybe two football fields away from my father's house. Oh, that's what an amazing full circle moment. Well, I remember him telling me growing up there wasn't necessarily the easiest way to grow up as a kid. Did you have similar experiences? Yeah, absolutely. I had a very rough lifestyle. Or Growing up on the east side of Detroit, I had a very tough life. Before the age of 10, I had two brothers pass. One brother passed. He got killed doing things inside the streets. And then another brother died by suicide. In addition to that, I also grew up next to a crack house. It was one of the things I had to cross or walk past every day of my life to go to school. Well, I am so sorry to hear that. And I remember growing up as a kid, I think my grandparents lived there from the time it was in the 50s or 60s all the way into the early 2000s. And I just saw that neighborhood change in so many ways during that period of my life, starting in the 70s until she ended up moving away when she got into her elder years. But I'm so sorry to hear that. One thing we might also share is I remember every time we would go to Detroit, my dad always wanted to get Detroit style pizza. And he would always talk about going to Buddy's up in Warren. But my uncle would always take us to a local convenience store that he thought had better pizza. But <laughs> are you still a fan of the Detroit pizza or do you like other styles better? Oh, man, this is a big debate between my Detroit friends and my New York friends whenever they get in the same room together. I'm a fan of both, but if I had to choose one, I'm choosing New York pizza or Detroit pizza all the time. <laughs> I agree with you. I don't like the thicker <laughs> crust as much as I like the thin crust, but we digress on Detroit for a, a few seconds there. Well, I have a really good friend, Tom Riley, who played uh, for Notre Dame on their football team from that kind of 85 through 88 year period where they won that national championship. And Tom, similar stature to you, he's about 6'7", six, 6'8", six, even now is probably 350 to 400 pound range. But I remember him telling me that while he was at Notre Dame uh, for so many of the years, him being a football player kind of defined his existence. And then he ended up getting uh, really injured playing. And his last year, he wasn't able to play. And he said it was such a shocking transformation going from having these varsity tables, everyone looking out for you, ha being surrounded by people who are wanting to see you succeed and help you get through to then feeling like he had no support at all. Did you have a similar experience because I understand you started off playing college ball and yourself got injured and then 
had to make a pivot to, and went back to a different university. That is very interesting. Yes. I would say it is definitely something that I experienced as well, playing collegiate football and then life after collegiate football. I didn't necessarily get injured in football, per se, in my story. What actually happened to me is that the football coach quit. So when a new coach came in, he told everybody that everybody's going to have to retry out again. And I don't know, 19-year-old Martinez was not for that. So I quit football. Luckily for myself, I had a decent GPA and transferred to a different school. And to go through that, going to a school where your name, it was respect was given or it was just always commended because you were on the football team. So just being like a regular individual, but still having like football team habits. So what I mean by that is that when I started playing my freshman year in college, the football coach would tell me, you are too light. You need to gain more weight. And he would tell me, eat whatever's not voted down to the ground. When I stopped playing football, I still had that habit. I ballooned up because I wasn't being as active as I was or meeting demands of playing football, but I was still eating like I was. I remember Tom telling me, uh, similar to you, he went through a coaching change as well because halfway through his time there, Lou Holtz came on and he told me it was really interesting because you either felt like you were part of Lou Holtz's team or mm -hmm. you didn't feel like it at all, but he said the whole program changed. And another thing I can sympathize with you on is I had a number of friends at the Naval Academy who played on the football team. And interestingly enough, these guys, especially the linemen, would try to gain all this weight, but then in order to get commissioned, they had to get under 250 pounds. So I remember so many of them in this mad rush over the last six months that they were there trying to lose 40, 50, 60, 70 pounds so that they could get commissioned in the military. I think that's the craziest thing when I would say like our bodies become like commodities for like whatever sport, for a specific position, you got to be a certain weight, you got to be a certain height and so on and so forth. But I find that interesting that when you add like Navy, the Naval Academy on top of that, how that dichotomy of gaining weight and like being this big to play this particular sport was almost at odds of like them getting commissioned. And what that really is telling about like what really matters in life per se. Like, I just find it very interesting, especially being on the other side of like no longer playing football or just no longer being even interested in watching football anymore because like I've seen the behind the scenes that it doesn't even like interest me anymore. Well, it is interesting. Almost all the professional athletes or high caliber collegiate athletes I met who play football, almost none of them now watch the sport. It, it's interesting. Tom does a yearly get together and he has somewhere between 20 and 30 of his teammates from Notre Dame come to his house. And I would say the vast majority of them, Steve Berline, Tim Brown, people of that caliber played in the NFL, but almost none of them today uh, have anything to do with it or even watch it. So it's more common than you would think across these elite athletes. Absolutely. Well, Martinez, can you take us back to that pivotal moment when your doctor gave you a stern warning to lose weight or die, which I can't even believe a doctor telling someone that. How did you find the inner strength to turn that moment into a catalyst for positive change? Yeah, let's talk about this. So I started running back in 2012. So before then I was working at Men's Work. So I was a commission salesman on my feet eight to 10 hours a day. And actually like I wanted to go see this doctor because I was having some hip issues. So this is the first time he ever seen this doctor. He didn't know me. He didn't have any. And I'm sitting in a doctor's office down. I'm like, doc, I started this job. I have hip pain. I used to play football. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I'm on my feet eight to 10 hours a day. And he goes, I know why you're in pain. Me? Okay. Like why? Because you ain't put a stethoscope on me. You ain't touched my thigh. You ain't did anything. And he just went on to say, you're fat. And then he also went on to say, you need to lose weight or die. John, I was taken aback because, yes, I'm a big guy. I've been a big guy all my life. But I just told this man, I'm on my feet, like eight to 10 hours a day. 
right? Like I'm moving, I'm shaking, I'm on the sales floor. It's not like I'm just sitting at home, like laying on the couch eating potato chips. So for him, it's just to say, you need to lose weight or die. I was just taking a bet. So then he also went on to say, you need to start losing weight by walking on the track and eating a better diet. And I laughed because I was already on my feet eight to 10 hours a day. I'd say something facetious of, you get walking, I'm going to run a marathon instead. He laughs at me and tells me that's the most stupidest thing he has heard in all his years of practicing medicine. So now the steam is really coming out my ears, right? And I had a few other choice words for him that I won't say on this kid-friendly podcast, but I ended up storming out of, doc- out of that doctor's office. And as I was driving home, I seen a, a running shoe store. And I went in there and I told them I need shoes and I need them now. Because in my mind, they already had clicked. I was going to run that marathon today. Now, there was a problem though, John. I did not quite know how far a marathon was. (laughs) So for the longest, I was telling my friends, oh, I'm going to run. 5k marathon until one of my running friends came to me and it's like martinez those two things don't make sense there's a 5k and there's a marathon so john imagine your friend okay well how far is a 5k and they go it's 3.1 miles okay so now you're reasoning well a marathon can be no more than what 10 miles so how far is a marathon and he's like 26.2 miles and it's like 26 26- Point two miles? What is this? Who runs it? But it was one of those things where I made that commitment to myself that I was going to run this marathon. I was going to prove this doctor wrong. And that was the initial fuel to my fire to continue to go on uh, throughout this journey. Well, just to give you some context, I know a thing or two about running because I ran Division I uh, cross country and track at the Naval Academy. But you are absolutely correct in that if you are used to running a 5K or a 10K, even a half a marathon, there is a huge colossal jump up to running a marathon. And the ones I've done, especially once you hit that 18, 19, 20 mile area, it is always brutal to get through uh, that period. I don't care how good a shape you're in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it is uh, brutal. Well, you want to hear something incredible. I have a good friend of mine, Kellyanne, who just did the seven continent marathon challenge. She did seven marathons on seven continents in seven days. Okay. And to make it even more incredible, the first day they started in Antarctica. And she said, as they were running in their snow boots, one leg seemed like it was so easy. <laughs> until they turned around and were in the middle of a 40 mile per hour wind hitting them the other way as they're running in full (laughs) snow clothes. And she ends up making it about 10 miles into that and had a blister on the bottom of her foot about the size of a tennis ball. So she had to compete in that marathon and the rest of them with that large, a blister, which had to be excruciating. Yeah, absolutely. Well, getting back to your story, I remember uh, when I was in the military, there was a senior officer that I worked with who was a heavy smoker, et cetera. And he, similar to you, came up with this ambition that he wanted to run a marathon. And I remember as he was starting out, he was not able to run from one telephone pole to the next one without stopping. And he told me he started to judge his runs by going from one two telephone poles to three to four to five, and eventually gave up smoking and eventually accomplished his goals. As you were starting out on your journey, how difficult did you find it to become a runner? Oh man, John, it was by far one of the hardest physical things that I did to that day. Even like playing collegiate football, running and like running long distances was the hardest thing that I did. So let me tell you about my first run. So, you know, I get home with these running shoes, And I am inconveniently sandwiched in between two gazelles. One guy is going 10 on the treadmill. The other guy is going nine on the treadmill. And I'm sizing these guys up and they're making it look so effortlessly on these treadmills. I'm talking, these guys are going nine and I can at least go seven. I put seven on the treadmill and as the belt is running, 
between my legs. I'm thinking to myself, like, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. And then I was like, you know what? I got to do this. So I get on the treadmill and I feel like my life flashed before my eyes. I felt like the treadmill was rejecting me or my body was rejecting the treadmill. But when it was all said and done, I actually fell off the treadmill. And the noise that my body made when I fell off the treadmill was deafening. And as the gazelles were still running on the treadmill, they looked down, like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, I just lost my balance. That was my first run. And when I looked up at the treadmill, I, I've only ran 15 seconds. To go from not being able to run 15 seconds and falling off the treadmill, it was definitely a journey from like that to actually run a marathon. And it was so hard, but it was also rewarding because one of the things I just kept telling myself is that you can do it, you can do it, keep going. So every day, what I did was starting out was go to go on a trip and just run a little bit longer. So I went from 15 seconds to a minute and then a minute to like a minute and a half and so on and so forth and really started off there until I was able to run five or so minutes straight. So similar to you, I think a lot of people have these audacious goals that they would like to achieve in their life, but they have an issue of even getting started. And then once they get started, they have this natural inclination that when you face hardship or it doesn't go as easy as you think it's going to go, you end up stopping. What advice would you give someone who's maybe listening today who feels hesitant or apprehensive about starting whatever it is that they're ambitious to do and how they can take the initial steps to get there and overcome their hesitations. One of the things I usually tell people is that it's, it's really a mindset thing, right? And so for a lot of people in their head, it's all, oh, I can't do this. I see how far you kind of, I don't know if I can get there. And one of the things I try to tell people is that don't fall into this comparison trap. Like your day zero will look different from my day zero. And that's okay. And your day 100 will look different from my day 100. And that's okay. Because it's not where you started. It's where you're going. So that's the first thing that I'll tell people. The second thing I'll tell people is that we have to calm that inner critic. Right? Like this inner critic we have in our head uh, that's telling us we can't do it. It's impossible. Most of the time, it's in our voice. So we're, it's literally you telling you you can't do something. So one of the things that I've learned throughout all of the years of running and doing this is that, A, not everything you think about yourself is true, and B, not everything you feel about yourself is real. So one of the ways that I take this into process is to name my inner critic. So I gave him my inner critic a name, he had the persona, and then that way, it's not me telling me these things, it's this inner critic. So for example, my inner critic name is Otis. So whenever I have a defeating thought or a thought that's like trying to challenge me to say, no, you can't do it. It's not me telling me this, it's Otis telling me this. And now I can actually reason with these thoughts to say, okay, well, why are you feeling this? Is this because of fear? Is it because of doubt? Or is it because of something else? And really be able to reason with my thoughts to be able to move forward with that particular thing. Yeah, I think that's some excellent voice. And it is that inner critic that halts in so many ways, the absolute visions that we're trying to create for ourselves that we end up burning mm -hmm. down because we let our mind get in the way of the progress that we could make if we were intentional about the choices we were making to take us closer to those goals. I think that's a really important lesson for anyone to hear. Now, when I was reading the book, I understand that as you were running these races, you had some people who were pretty skeptical about uh, your running style and were even making jokes to you about it. How did that influence you and how did that evolve into the shirt that you're wearing right now that says slow AF? It's something about a person of size being active that kind of gives the liberty of other people to feel like they should tease that person. And this is, has happened even when I played football. Us as linemen, right, running to the wide receivers, they would jump on this as well. So it's something that 
A, I build the tough skin about, but also knowing that most of the time your biggest critic are people who don't even have the slightest idea the hardship and the obstacles you have to go through to even get to where you're at. I was running New York City Marathon. This is the first time I was running New York City Marathon. And there's this bridge called Queensboro Bridge. I'm not sure if you heard of this bridge. But Queensboro Bridge is a very nasty, mean bridge. And the reason why this bridge is mean is because there's no spectators on this course, on, on that particular bridge. It was literally you, the sound of your feet paid, you know, pounding the ground, other people around you breathing, and then the sounds of trains, right? It's by far the most depressing thing that you go to. And it's also uh, a point of the race where the voices really start to kick up to tell you, you can't do this. You get off this bridge and you head on to First Avenue, which is also a, a steep incline. And as I was on First Avenue, I uh, made eye contact with this guy. And he was pointing at me, thinking he was about to cheer me on and give me a high five or something when I go over here. I think of my AirPods. And he called me slow. I won't say the words, but you can infer what slow AF means. He called me slow AF and told me to go home. And I was taken aback again. And I asked him what? And he was like, you're slow AF, go home. And in true New York fashion, I get in an argument with the guy. Because I'm like, you're on the side of the course, drinking a beer, laughing at me, pointing at me, telling me I need to go home. I to be out here. Meanwhile, you're on the side of the course drinking a beer. You're not even running. It don't even look like you're running. But you have the nerve, the gall, to call me slow and tell me I don't need to be on this course. When I finished the race, I vowed to myself that I was going to wear slowly up across my chest as a badge of honor. It was almost like the S on Superman's chest. That was my F. And for me, it was just a constant reminder of there's so many obstacles that I had to go through to get to the starting line, let alone all the obstacles in a race that I had to go through to get to the finish line. That's what slowly off mean to me. And that's how I got there. When your great book, Slow AF Run Club, which was released in June, you talk about embracing your body as it is right now. How did you cultivate self-acceptance and how do you encourage others to do the same? That is a great question. How do I cultivate self-acceptance? I think one of the things that we really have to do, John, is limit the amount of inputs that we get. What are we watching on TV? What are we watching on social media? And what are these messages telling each other and telling us about who we are? My background is in marketing, right? So I really understand like how most marketing goes from a deficit mindset versus from a binders mindset. Well, most marketing is telling you, oh, you don't have this. Oh, you want washboard ads. Oh, you want X, Y, and Z. All you need is this peel or all you need is this powder or this shake and so on and so forth. So one of the things that once you learn that and you understand that all marketing is made to do is to make you feel either bad about yourself and to make you buy into that particular product, I really start to just dig deep on myself to really understand, well, what are my wants and my needs in order to make myself feel happy, right? So one of the things I noticed is that running was the thing that brought me the most joy. And being active was the most thing that, like, the thing that also brought me joy as well. So I vowed to myself to say, you know what? I'm going to run and be active regardless if I lose weight or not. So if I lose weight, great. But if I don't, that's not going to stop me from being active and enjoying my life to the fullest. So one of the things that I tell people to go back to your question is to really think about the benefits of physical activity and really break it down to simplest terms. People think, oh, I need to be healthy, which means I need to lose weight, which means I need to work out. So then they work out and then they don't necessarily lose weight in that amount of time that they had in the last day a month. And then they get discouraged and they don't work out anymore. They just lose the motivation to do that. 
So one of the things I try to tell people is that instead of using weight loss as a goal, like what about using joy? What about all the other benefits that comes with regular physical activity that can help you be more beneficial and will lead to a healthier life, even if you don't lose weight? This is one of those things of really changing um, that mindset to really understand that weight loss don't have to end, be the end all be all and really think about health, but also to understand that marketing and diet culture marketing is really meant to make you feel bad about yourself and the goal of making you buy a pill powder or shake or follow a particular diet. Yes, I know so many people right now are taking that new prescription drug to do the quick weight loss technique because I think there's so much societal pressure on people to feel like they have to lose it. But I think in the book, as you were just alluding to, you bring up so many incredible benefits in your case of running, but in anyone's case of doing physical type of exercise, including better sleep, stronger muscles, cardiovascular health, sense of community, mental health, etc., how have all these positive impacts shaped your life now that you've started to do this? And how do you help others experience those benefits too? Absolutely, John. Like, how it has shaped my life is that running and physical activity has taken me to places that I've never been or probably would have been in my life. For example, I had the opportunity to run in London with friends and just go pub to pub looking for trickle pudding. I had the funnest time doing that. I was able to run in Berlin. I was able to do things that I never thought I would do across the Golden Gate Bridge. Physical activity was more or less the gateway for me to enjoy life and travel to various places that I've never seen in my life. So I think like that's something that I want to be able to give to everyone else to let them know that you never know but this sport or this particular physical activity would take you. Like as you just said, like you just had a friend run seven continents, seven marathons in seven days. That's amazing. And those are the types of things that running and having physical activity in your life can bring towards you. If I didn't run, I would never talk about traveling to all these other places and running and having any specific goals of I want to try to run all 50 states or being a part of the seven continent club and things of that sort. But now that I'm having it, those are things that I can look forward to and to aim and strive to. Well, Martinez, I have purposely not brought on some mega stars onto this podcast because I think you have someone like Tony Robbins or someone of that caliber. People tend to have a hard time relating to how do I go from where I'm at today to Tony Robbins, because it's a, mm. let's face it, it's a pretty big jump, but let's look back at you. You started this journey about 10, 11 years ago, really from square one. And you've now been featured in the New York times. You've got a best selling book. You've been on the cover of runner's world. When you started this journey 10, 11 years ago, would you have ever imagined that any of that would have happened? Absolutely not. I was just more or less trying to, through my doctor wrong <laughs> and let him know that I can run a marathon and, and, and do it and not die. But it, it has been an amazing journey these past 10 years. And I'm just extremely grateful that I can be a light to other people in their journey wherever they're at right now. It has been amazing. I'm currently on a 40 day book tour just to see the amount of people that come to me tears in the eyes, smiling, laughing, and just being like, you changed my life. And like your story, it's just something that feels attainable and something that I can just heavily relate to. And for them to just let me know that I and my story has changed my life. And for me, it was a complete honor because it was something that I never looked out to be, right? I never thought to myself, hmm, I'm gonna go and run a marathon. And seeing years later, I'm writing a book and do all this other stuff. It just fell in my lap. I see myself as a reluctant leader, and, and a lack of better words, or a reluctant superhero, because this wasn't the thing that I looked forward to. Like, <laughs> this wasn't the thing that I was like, oh, I'm going to do that towards it. It just fell in my lap. Well, one of the things you were just talking about is having resilience. 
In what ways do you think running has helped you cultivate resilience in the way you lead your life? Running, I like to say, is an allegory for life because doing tough things in one thing can be transferable to other parts of your life. The fact that I've been a runner for 10 plus years has definitely translated to me starting my own business, me starting a clothing line with no experience and just going on a journey, me creating an app for my community. Pretty much any and everything that I've done for the sport of running has been because of me knowing that I've done harder things in the sport of running. It's, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, oh, running a business is hard or starting a business is hard or learning how to create clothes is hard. And, and my thing is, what's hard, what's even harder, <laughs> like running Big Sur Marathon. What else is harder? Running up a mountain. What else is harder? Conquering your voice, conquering that inner voice that's telling you to no, don't do it, or telling you to quit. And you go on to do it as well. I would say everything about me, where I'm at now, has really been about resilience and being resilient in the sport of running has definitely translated to me being resilient in the sport of life. Yeah, it's interesting. I have a really good friend who lives right up the road from me who's a retired Navy captain SEAL. And he tells me all the time that the thing that scares him the most is public speaking. And I think <laughs> here you are, this guy who's gone through BUD, you've gone on numerous combat deployments, you reach the pinnacle of being a, a Navy captain in an elite fighting unit, and you're telling me you're scared to go talk to people? And he said, I absolutely <laughs> was terrified. And so you know what he did about it? He has just thrown himself out there to speak anywhere. He volunteers at churches, he volunteers at colleges, he volunteers at high schools, because he has a message that he wants to tell the world, and he feels that if he doesn't get comfortable on the podium talking to people, he'll never be able to influence people the way he wants to. And I think the same thing could be said about any goal that you want to achieve, but it's purposely putting yourself into that uncomfortable situation that gets you there. And I use that story to lead up to this because I understand now that you've created a global community with the Slow AF Run Club, which is an incredible feat by itself. But how are you, through this club, inspiring people to take actions like my friend did to change their lives? Oh, yeah. So Slow Young Run Club has about 17,000 members worldwide. And our mission with the Run Club is to inspire 1 million people to run in the body that they have right now. One of the things or a few ways that we do that. Um, it's about providing education, inspiration, motivation, but also group meetups across the nation. And one of the things that typically happens, this is literally just the cycle of our members, is that a member come in and they're like, oh, I'm not a runner. I think I can do it, so on and so forth. And what the community does is love on that person, right? Let them know that they can do it. Provide them with tips and tricks to get them on their first run. Check in on them after they ran their first run in order to figure out what other things they need to help troubleshoot on. And it's really about letting people know that they're not alone in this journey. So just the fact of people knowing that they're not alone, people continue to start running. They run their first race. They feel so proud about themselves when they get that race medal in their hand to say, look, I've done it. And they continue to go run more. And then they just become the next individuals to help the next person who's coming in Telling, telling us that they can't run, they don't know what to do, and they just want to be active. That's how the Slurry Front Club does that, man. It's been an amazing thing to see how this community has a life of its own and pretty much runs itself now at this moment. If someone out there is wanting to start their own movement, what were some of the challenges that you had to overcome in creating this community, and what were some of the things that allowed it to really accelerate because I remember when I was doing background on this, you only had 10,000 members in the club. Now you're up to 17,000. And I find that these things are a compounding effect and they yes. just keep growing and growing, but getting started can be 
a difficult task. I would say the, the, the first part, yeah, that is the difficult path, is going from zero to one. I started this community with 40 people, and now we're up at you know, 17,000 members. And I would say one of the difficult things of doing this community was really trying to figure out a mission that we can hone in, figuring out our messaging. And then the other thing is really letting people know what we want them to do and what were their expectations um, inside of this community. I think that's another thing that for a lot of people, they don't have, or they don't necessarily give the next step for someone to do. More or less how I think about my community and how I think about most things is that this community is a party and it's a party at my house. John, if you came to my house and I had a party, I wouldn't just open the door and not say anything. You come to my house and you know, this is the first time you're in my house and it's my party. I want to make sure you get good. I want to make sure that I, I grabbed your coat. I want to make sure that you got water. I want to make sure that you found somebody that you can have a connection with so you can talk to somebody and feel entertained. And I think when it comes to online communities, people just say, oh, people been a part of Facebook groups before or whatever. And people just know how to do that. And my answer is no, they don't. You have to be the model for it, but you also have to think about what you want individuals to do at your party. I think that was the, the biggest challenge that I had and how I overcame it is to really think about that. This is my house. You're having a party at my house and I want to be the hostess at the mostest. So that means that once you leave this party, you're going to go out to your other friends. Yo, I was a Martinez Adams party. And let me tell you, I had the greatest time ever. And the next time this man have a party, you should come because you're going to have a great time as well. So that's how I think about my community and running communities. And I think that's what's missing out of communities, especially in the space of like info businesses and things of that sort is that everybody has a community. These communities be like raving communities, but they're not doing anything to make a community or a party fun. It's like having a party and not having music or doors in that. You just have a space and not give people any other direction to do inside of this space. Well, I love that answer. And uh, you got to have the community have fun. You got to get them to feel like they're part of it. They want to bring others into it, experience what they're doing as well. Well, you're doing a great job of it. And I understand, Martinez, that your advocacy in the club extends beyond running to issues like mental health, inclusion, and diversity. How do you use your platform and the club to intentionally address important topics like these? It's about leading by example and being a servant leader. Right? So mental health is a, a definitely uh, a big thing that, that has affected me. So early on today, I told you that my brother died by suicide. So that has been a big thing in my life. And it has been a big thing that I have to deal with from the age of 10. It's one of those things that I just want to make sure I give back and let everybody know that they're not alone with their particular issues. And one of the things that we do inside the community, like I said, I'm a servant leader, is by leading by example and letting people know like these are the expectations that we expect inside of this community. Everyone is suspected to be an advocate for mental health. Everyone is suspected to be an advocate for inclusion. And if you're not doing that, maybe we're not the community for you. So it's just already ingrained in expectations that this is what you're expected to do inside of this community. It goes back to giving people rules and boundaries and expectations and not just giving them the space and not telling them what to do. So it's almost like starting a Facebook group and setting the guidelines in it of how you want people to act in the group. More or less, but I think it, it goes beyond that. Like, people don't read those guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ain't nobody reading those guidelines. I think it goes to like setting an example and having constant conversations about it inside the community. Because it goes back to that thing of, yeah, these are the guidelines. Real action happens via conversation amongst each other by having deep new conversations amongst each other that's where real action happens yeah i couldn't agree more well following on that 
discussion on mental well-being in your group, I wanted to ask you, how do you intentionally prioritize mental well-being, especially while you're now juggling a very hectic schedule? You mentioned that you're on a 40-place uh, book tour right now. You've got other things that are going on. And I know myself, when I've become really busy, that it's easy to deprioritize that. So how do you make sure that you're keeping it front of mind? So it's one of the things that's baked into my life. There's always time off, just already baked into this thing. And I think just having time off and having rest is one of the things that's super important for mental health. Another thing is that for seeing a therapist, I'll see my therapist sometimes twice a month, once a week, depending on the time. For just having someone, that uh, a third party that can help me with what I'm going through. And then the last thing I do, John, that I think is, is a sleeper that a lot of people fail to do, is just journal. I, when I'm ever on a flight or if I'm traveling somewhere, or right before I go to bed, or even when I wake up in the morning, I just journal a few lines just to get my thoughts and feelings out. Just to even just talk about what's going on in that particular time. And there's something about writing those thoughts, feelings, emotions down. It can be cathartic so that you can release, so you can go out through your life. I think that's extremely important. And they often say until you write something down, it uh, you don't release it or it doesn't come to fruition. Well, Martinez, can you share an intentional habit or routine outside of running that has significantly contributed to your personal growth and success? This is another sleeper, right? It, a habit or routine that really has contributed to my success is having monthly talks with my mentor. I have a mentor that I talk to on a weekly or sometimes monthly basis that I'm out with ideas on them. So any harebrained idea or when it comes to my business, I run it through my mentor first and we're able to have these brain trust meetings about what I'm thinking. Make their job is to tear down these ideas and thoughts in order to build it up stronger and help question what's the validity, but also the ultimate goal for this new tactic or idea that I have in mind. So that's something that I do on a regular basis. And then Martinez, my last question for you would be, if someone was listening to the podcast today and they were gonna pick up your book and read it, what would be one or two key things that you would want them to take away from the book, or it could be this episode? Absolutely. So the two things that I want people to take away from this is that a mindset is key. It's like that famous quote, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're true. So that's the first thing is that we all have to work on our mindset and really tone down that voice that tells us we can't do it. The second thing is, it's not where you're starting, it's where you're going. All of us are going to have a day zero. All of us might even have multiple days, and that's okay. But four is slow, and four is still progress. So those are two things that I want people to remember throughout this book, as well throughout this podcast. Okay, well, Martinez, thank you so much for the honor and privilege of coming on our show. It was such an honor to have you. Thank you, John. I really appreciate it. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Martinez Evans, and I wanted to thank Martinez, Marissa Franco, and Penguin Random House for the honor and privilege of having them appear on today's show. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview that I did with Evo Bergmans, who is a renowned philosopher, management consultant, and author of the groundbreaking book, Paradoxical Leadership. Through his practical methodology and extensive toolkit, Evo shows us how to transform diverse dilemmas into creative solutions and paralyzing polarization into constructive dialogue. People might think, oh, paradoxical leadership, that is very difficult because we always need to find the perfect balance in the middle. No, that is absolutely not true. In fact, it is you can go black, you go white, you can go gray, you can go everything in the middle, but you need to make a conscious choice. Remember that we rise by lifting others, so share the show with those that you love and care about. And if you found today's episode useful, then share it with someone who can use the advice that we gave today. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. Until next time, go out there and become passion struck.